members of the jury, members of the public, I'm very honored to be here today. Um, I'm actually not going to speak as complicity per se, but about processes of accountability and uh, issues regarding uh, international criminal responsibilities. Uh, I'm a lobbyist. Uh, I work for a platform of NGOs. I'm based in Brussels, and uh, as such, I'm in touch almost every day with uh, EU decision makers and EU officials. I'm also a French citizen, European citizen, who care for Palestine, and who cares as well about the morality of um, the relations that the EU and Europe conducts with its partners abroad. Uh, the way it conducts its external actions as well. When I saw what happened this summer, when I was following the news, and when I hear all these testimonies, well, there is one thing which comes to my mind, is, well, justice must be done. I think it's what comes to all of our mind today. The people who committed those crimes must be tried, and they must be put behind bars. We know that the Israeli judicial system is not fitted for that. Um, just if you take the example of Kasled, out of the 400 incidents reported by the Israeli army when they conducted their own investigations, well, only three led to indictment, and the harshest sentence was for the case of a soldier who stole a credit card. So international law prescriptions are very clear about that. When domestic authorities are unable or unwilling to comply with their obligations, then international justice mechanism must be activated. So I'm going to show actually how the international, the European Union, but also in collision with um, the US, uh, has blocked access to these international mechanisms of accountability. I'm going to focus on the EU because we are based in Brussels, because it's my main topic of expertise, and also because, well, most of us here are Europeans, so we're in a better position to address EU and European decision makers about that. And I can tell you that I really think it's one of the highest case of European hypocrisy. I will remain calm from the beginning. <laughs> I'm going to demonstrate how the EU has helped burying the, report, the Goldstone report. And I'm going to also talk about EU's position regarding the Palestinians' access to the International Criminal Court. So let's start with Goldstone. You'll remember, short after the end of the so-called Operation Castled, the Human Rights Council um, established a commission of inquiry, which was led by Judge Goldstone, and which presented its findings in uh, September 2009 to the Human Rights Council. The, re the Goldstone report was an earthquake and scared many in Washington, in Jerusalem, and in Brussels and other European capitals. Why? Goldstone was credible, its report was credible, and the recommendations of the report actually placed everyone in front of their responsibility, being Israel, Hamas, the PA, UN organs, high contracting parties of the Fourth Geneva Convention that all EU member states have ratified. So, well, the, the recommendations were first and foremost directed at Hamas, the PA, and Israel to conduct credible investigation and indict um, and try indicted criminals. It did not happen. In an ideal case scenario, the UN Security Council should have referred the case to the International Criminal Court. And that was really the problem with the Goldstone Report. So we looked into WikiLeaks, very good source of information, um, to see really what happened with the Goldstone Report. 
And we found out, and I guess what WikiLeaks is only giving us the, t the tip of the iceberg. But we find out before uh, the presentation of the report and after intense discussions between Israel and the US about Goldstone and the threat that Goldstone were presenting to, the Israel, to the Israelis, and actually that, well, going to the ICC was an act of war for Israel. And uh, most interestingly, because this is not very surprising, I would say, you see a set of diplomatic demarches from the US to its allies, so understand well, the European states and others, on how to bury the Goldstone Report. So you can really read black and white that this should contain the ending of the report in Geneva, understand the Human Rights Council as long as possible, minimize the activities at the UN Security Council and the UN General Assembly, and prevent the efforts to, re to prevent efforts to refer the matter to the International Criminal Court. What the EU did, or what EU member states do? Well, basically, they acquiesced and follow US instruction because you can see in the diplomatic cables that they share the same concern as the US when it comes to relaunching peace negotiations. And of course, any mechanism of international accountability would be detrimental to that. They sometimes directly told the Israelis that handing over a report on internal investigation would be sufficient for them. I doubt that they even read the report, or certainly they did not give any assessment about the report that the Israelis were handing out. We can see, of course, and this is in the public domain, that they were very split during the vote at the Human Rights Council. But actually, well, when you look again into those cables, you see the explanation for that. It's not about really the, con the, um, the content itself of the, of the resolution at the Human Rights Council itself. I mean, because at the end, the plan of the US at work and the resolution at the Human Rights Council were quite harmless. So, the division was mostly about maintaining a balance between EU member states. And this is a bit difficult to understand, and you have to put yourself into the psyche of an EU diplomat to understand that. So, they would all aim at abstaining, because they had to show a common front. But some member states, being more Catholic than the Pope and following US instructions, say, no, no, we're going to vote no. So if some member states vote no and some member states abstain, well, you need to find a balance with that. So other member states will say, we will vote yes. You understand? It's not very clear. But it's EU dip diplomacy. So this actually, well, what happened with Goldstone is a kind of teaser with what is going to happen with the Shabbos Commission of Inquiry. I don't think we can have much hope about the support of the EU to this uh, the report that, well, we hope that uh, the Commission of Inquiry will produce. All um, EU member states in Geneva this summer uh, abstain. Finally, well, they managed to find a common front. Well done. Um, they abstain to the resolution establishing the Commission of Inquiry. Um, well, you see that, well, the UK is raising a dissident voice and they issued a press communique where you understand that they would have voted no but for the sake of European unity, they prefer to vote to abstain. But, uh, and they call the Commission of Inquiry an unnecessary mechanism. So this is quite important because actually, well, the work that the Commission is going to be produce would be very important and would give, give a lot of grounds for the Palestinians to go to the ICC. So this is my next point, because I see, well, believe with many, okay that the ICC is maybe the only judicial mechanism available for the Palestinians right now. I mean, we, we saw that, well, some EU states had adopted the um, law on uh, universal jurisdiction, but progressively they closed really, they, they restrain it to, to uh, it, 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 the application became very, very limited. So the ICC maybe is the only way, is the only way forward. And actually, well, the EU 
is the most important supporter in the national community of the ICC. It's a stated objective of its external relation to promote universal ratification of the Rome Statute. It even like set up a kind of action plan, the detailing tools, diplomatic tools to fulfill its objectives. Diplomatic demarche, dialogue, and even it goes to well, um, signing commercial agreements where they insert clauses referring to the ICC and support to the ICC. The EU also is a big financial contributor to the ICC in 2013. It contributed to 54% of the entire budget. And referrals to the ICC were promoted in cases of conflict, such as, for instance, Sudan, where a peace process was going on, and as well as the case of Syria. Well, it did not happen, but I mean, the referral to the ICC in the case of Syria is something that you find in many EU declarations. But when you come to Palestine, the answer is no. No Palestinians don't go to the ICC. That would be detrimental to the peace process. So maybe you remember, where to find some um, elements of proof regarding that in the public domain? That's not quite evident because you have had intense media reporting uh, at the time of um, the UN state would be, the Palestinian state would be at the UN in November, where it was reported that actually some EU member states with Catherine Ashton had put pressure on the Palestinians and say, well, we would, of course, vote in favor of you being an observer sta state, but the condition is you don't go to the ICC. Uh, you have, well, only William Hague, UK again, I'm sorry to pinpoint at just one member state, but at least it's the one who speaks out. Uh, William Hague said in November 2012 that uh, going to the ICC would make a return to negotiations absolutely impossible. Um, Nicolas Sarkozy at the UN said at the time that uh, addressing the UNGA uh, said that um, Palestinians should use um, their status in the UN in a constructive manner, or something, something like this in English. So, actually, well, the official position of the EU on this, you find it in the latest, one of the latest council declaration uh, in July 2014, when actually the war in Gaza was raging, where they say, I quote, the European Union reiterates its call upon the Palestinian leadership to use constructively its UN status and not to undertake steps which would lead further away from a negotiated solution. Well, you should understand, Palestinians don't go to the ICC. And it's what we heard in many, many meetings that we had with EU representatives. Incidentally, as well, it's in the same declaration that when the war was raging, well, you can find some elements in the declaration which are just copy and paste of the Israeli discourse that we heard at the time. So for instance, that they were embracing the self-defense argument, calling on Hamas not to call on its population to be used as human shield, no mention of Israelis using Palestinian as human shield, etc., cetera, et cetera. Same summer as well that the EU adopted very harsh sanctions on Russia after the invasion of Crimea. But anyway, case of double standards. So I would conclude, yeah, Palestinians, you must go to the ICC. And we must take this up into our campaign. I mean, understand that Palestinians have the primary responsibility in taking up this decision, and it's a very complicated decision to take, apparently. But at least, well, if they had the Europeans on their side, I mean, that would certainly change the game. Victims need justice, the principle of equal access to justice and the credibility of the court is at stake. And I think that also, while well, going to the ICC could create an incentive for Israel to be serious really about ending the occupation. So it would certainly create an electroshock into the Israeli population which could understand that there is a price to pay. There's a price to be paid in waging wars the way their army did. And well, also, it's a way to end this impunity 
and maybe it's a way to avoid having another Gaza in two years' time. So I really think we need to address this with our decision makers. Not everyone is aware of the EU's position on this. We need to name and shame. We need to find our allies in Europe. And we need to present the case of double standards. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much.